Ephesians chapter 5. And if you want to get a head start for extra credit and fabulous prizes, put a finger in Luke chapter 1. We're going to be spending a decent chunk of time this morning in Luke's Gospel for reasons that I'll explain when we get there. But last week we left off in Ephesians 5, verse 21, and I mentioned at the time, as we wrapped up last week, I said that we'd be coming back and that we'd be spending a week digging into it. Turns out Rob's not the only one who has a flexible relationship with the truth when he stands behind this pulpit. (laughs) I spoke too soon. Got a little ahead of myself. We're not going to spend a week here. I think three, actually. Yeah, maybe four. Because verse 21 points at a concept that I really do think is one of the most important in the New Testament. I didn't lie about that last week. I think that verse 21 brings us to a concept that's one of the most important in the New Testament and I think also one of the most neglected. Not so much because we don't understand it, but because we don't like it very much. Serving. We don't like it very much. We very much don't like it. Because it, it, it gets to the heart. It comes against the very heart of our sin nature. Ephesians 5.21. Paul exhorts us to submit to one another in love. In the fear of the Lord. Ephesians 5.21, it comes at the end of a a long, really a run-on sentence, one of these complex compound sentences we've come to expect from Paul. Starts at verse 18, goes all the way through verse 21, but the concept that he ends with, the exhortation that he lands on, it it really finds its roots all the way at the beginning of the chapter and and arguably even earlier. But we'll just start at the beginning of chapter 5 for simplicity's sake, where Paul says, be imitators of God. He, the, 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 the preface, the preamble to that, the foundation that he lays for that, is, is reminding us in chapters 1 through 3 that Christ came for us and Christ died for us, and because he did, God forgave us. Jesus died on the cross. He paid the price for our sin, and because he did, if, if we've responded to the gospel, if we've gone to the cross, if we've asked for forgiveness on the basis of his shed blood, God has forgiven us. And that's so good. But now that he has, now that God has forgiven us, what does he expect of us? We've we've asked God to forgive us. What does he ask of us? He asks us. He asks us in the sense of invites us. God doesn't demand anything from us, but he invites us. He gives us the opportunity to follow him. And we find that idea expressed different ways in different words in different parts of Scripture. But it's always the answer. The the, the question, what do we do with so great a salvation? The answer is always, pattern our lives after the one who made that salvation possible. Pattern our lives after the one who saved us. Last year we came across that idea in Romans 12, verse 1, where Paul expresses it this way, Dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. I'm reading from the New Living Translation, if you don't recognize it. I I think that the New Living editors render this in a really neat way. Because of all that he's done for you, let your bodies be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind God will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. That was last year in Romans. This year in Ephesians, Paul says much the same thing. He says, therefore, Ephesians 5 verse 1, Because of the blood of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus, be imitators of God as dear children. Imitate Jesus. Follow him. Love him. Seek to be like him. And for this entire chapter, really two chapters, but especially this chapter, Paul's been telling us what he means by that. He's been making more more concrete how to do that. Imitate God? How, Paul? Take Jesus as a role model. Walk in love like him. That was verse 2. Walk in light like him. Verse 9. Walk in wisdom like him. Verse 15. Walk walk in praise like him. Verse 19. Walk in service like him. Verse 21. And that's where we often get stuck. 
Gratitude, sure. Praise, you bet. Light, okay, because that's sort of vague and amorphous. But then serve, that's disturbingly concrete. And it sounds sacrificial. Serve like him. I mean, it's a concept that our minds don't have a problem with. Our minds willingly acknowledge that, but man, our pride resists it, doesn't it? Our brain reads verse 21 and says, well, yeah, I mean, it's there in black and white. What do you want me to do? That's the clear teaching of Scripture. Listen to the words of Jesus for, for crying out loud. Our brain has to assent to it. But our heart? Our brain is saying, yeah, I mean, that makes sense. And our heart is saying, no! What are you doing? No, turn back, turn back now. Submit to one another in the fear of the Lord? Submit to one another in reverence? Submit to one another out of awe? Submit to, other, to others as worship? Submit to one another because that's what Jesus did. <laughs> Submit! <clears throat> we joke on it. We trip on it. We choke on it. We stall out. Because our, our, our stubborn, stony heart objects to it. That phrase, submit to one another, it's a military term originally, or at least it's often used that way. It literally means to arrange under, in the sense of placing oneself under another in rank or authority. Placing one, oneself under the authority of another out of responsibility, or as Paul is suggesting, out of love. And it's an idea that runs all through Scripture. It's the same thing Paul expresses in Philippians 2, verse 3. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. It's interesting, now that a, a lot of us are reading gentle and lowly, that word lowly just jumps out of Scripture. It shows up so many places. In lowliness of mind, in humility, in other words. Let each esteem others better than himself. Submit to one another. Paul expresses that idea in Philippians 2, 3. He embraces it in 1 Corinthians 9, 19. For though I'm free from all men, I've made myself a servant to all. I've submitted to all. Placed myself under, in service to all. Why? That I might win some to Christ. Paul expresses this in Philippians. He embraces it to the Corinthians. And of course, it's the, the idea that Jesus embodies in John chapter 13. John chapter 13, just before the Last Supper, Jesus washing his disciples' feet. Washing Peter's feet. Washing Judas' feet. And explaining to them as he does, you call me teacher and Lord. And you say, well, you're not wrong, for so I am. But here's the thing. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, then it stands to reason you ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Jesus here is, is arguing from greater to lesser, the way that we see often in Scripture. It's a typical Hebrew form of argumentation. Jesus saying, hey, if this is true for me, and I'm the Son of God... Well, then logically, of, of necessity, it's also true, it must be true for you. I mean, and that makes sense. That, that logic is really unassailable, right? As Jesus humbled himself to serve us, we must, if Jesus did it, we must also humble ourselves to serve each other. It, the conclusion is inescapable. And yet... I think, I, think, I think in part because it's Jesus making the argument. Because it's Jesus who is saying this and using himself as an example, we feel sometimes like we can give ourselves a pass. I say we feel because I don't think we actually think about it this way. If we thought about it, we'd realize what we're doing, which is looking for a loophole. But because it's Jesus making the argument, we almost give ourselves permission to put it in a different category. Well, he's Jesus. He's the exception to every rule. Jesus, he's a, he's a special case. He's unique. 
and, 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 and we do that we, almost without thinking about it, and, and we do it instead of just accepting at face value the plain, simple meaning of what Jesus is saying, which is what's true for him is true for us. What's true for him must be true for us as we follow him, as we imitate him, which is everything we're talking about. But instead of accepting that, instead of embracing that and, 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 and running to obey God in that, we say to ourselves, yeah, but it's Jesus. I mean, who besides him can actually do that? Now, our, our brain might try to argue with our heart. Well, I mean, there's Paul. Didn't Paul say, imitate me as I imitate Christ? But our, our heart, our pride is saying, shh, don't argue with me when I'm rationalizing. Don't interrupt me. I've got, I've, got, I've, got, I've, got, I've got some good pushback going on here. But it doesn't work. Jesus says clearly, he says, he says bluntly, Matthew chapter 20, starting in verse 26, whoever desires to be great among you, let him be your servant. Whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. We read that, and we, we still manage to, 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 to hit, ignore, and override. We still manage to slide over our default, because we let that last phrase eclipse the whole point. Give his life a ransom for many. I can't do that. That's Jesus. He's the Son of God for crying out loud. He died on the cross, which is amazing, and I'm grateful, but it's Jesus, and it's really not me. Except that it should be me. It should be all of us. Because just in the short time we've been talking, we've, we've, we've seen Scripture say so how many different places? Ephesians, Philippians, 1 Corinthians, two different Gospels. The clear teaching of God's Word. The unmistakable instruction from God's Son. The call of God in our lives is to love like Jesus loves. And to serve like Jesus serves. Serves present tense because Hebrews 7.24, he even now lives to make intercession for us. Jesus is still serving us. Praying for us continually before, before the Father. Serve like Jesus serves. That's what Jesus taught us. And it's, and it's how Paul's exhorting us. Serve like we saw Jesus serve when he was among us. Because we can, and we should, and we get to. We're, we're tempted to file this out to the margins. Jesus is a special case. He's the exception to every rule. And, and we like that because it lets us off the hook. And yeah, Jesus is the Son of God. And that does push, put him in a, in, a, in, a, in a unique category. But he's also the Son of Man. And we need to not forget that. Jesus is fully God and fully man who served his entire life on earth as a man from incarnation to ascension and even in heaven today. Jesus continues to serve as a human, which means the ministry that he performed among us, he did by the same power that's available to us right now here today. Remember, in coming to live among us, he came to live as one of us. And I mean, that was an act of service right there, right? Philippians 2.7. Jesus made himself of no reputation. The ESV says Jesus emptied himself. And I think that's a powerful way of expressing it. Jesus emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men being found in appearance, living as a man. He was a man. He humbled himself. He humbled himself and continued to humble himself throughout his ministry and in humility became obedient throughout his life up to and including his death, the death on a cross. Jesus emptied himself. The New Living Translation says that he gave up divine privilege. Set aside the rights and privileges of being God and chose to operate not with all of the power of divinity but within the bounds of humanity. Why? To serve us. And at least in part, I think, to show us 
how to serve one another, to model that for us. Serve one another, be subject to one another, submit to one another, all ways of of translating Ephesians 5.21, which is going to be our text for the next few weeks. Submit to one another. Jesus began modeling that for us way before the cross. Years before he washed feet at the Last Supper. In fact, throughout his life, I think that... I haven't thought about this enough, but I think maybe the defining quality of Jesus, Jesus the Son of Man, is that he served. And served in ways that every one of us can. Ways that every one of us should. Ways that every one of us gets to and ways that every one of us is called to. We're called to serve. So with all of that as introduction, not just for this morning, but for this mini-series, let's take a deep dive together into the the implications of Ephesians 5.21. Turn with me now to Luke. and, And let's unpack some of this together. Luke chapter 1. Could have turned to any of the Gospels, to be honest. Luke especially fits our purposes this morning because Luke, of all the Gospel writers, is most concerned with Jesus' humanity. So in his Gospels, we find powerful examples and testimony and, and, and instruction and illustration about what it is to serve. Wait, what, is, doesn't Mark picture Jesus as the suffering servant? It does but, but Mark almost takes for granted that Jesus is serving. Luke, more, more, more dramatically, shows us Jesus choosing to serve. And so it's for that reason that I'm going this way. Jesus serving, choosing to serve. Responding to God's call on his life to serve. It's, it's literally in every chapter of Luke. Literally and clearly, and and that's how we're going to attack this study, is going chapter by chapter through Luke over the next few weeks, looking at how Jesus serves. Paul says imitate him. Walk in humility after him. Serve like him. Serve each other like he served us. What does that look like? How do we do that? What should we expect? Luke 1. We read in verse 31. The angel said to Mary, Behold, you'll conceive in your womb... And bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. Mary, you're going to have a baby. Talk about humility. Talk about, I'm going to sneeze. Talk about emptying oneself. Lowering oneself. Jesus came as a baby. Not just as a human, but as a baby human. A helpless, squalling, squirming infant i remember being at a a men's retreat pastor ken graves was teaching and 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 ken is from bangor maine and he's kind of a jack pine savage and he talks with a lower voice than i'm even talking in right now i would try to do his voice but i would break things (laughs) and and he said imagine that 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 god tells you that he's going to change your life and you're going to finish your days on earth living as a dog what kind of dog are you going to be guys And it's a men's retreat, so guys are saying, I'm going to be a Rottweiler. I'm going to be a Doberman. I'm going to be a German Shepherd because they have dignity. I'm going to be an Akita because they just don't care. And then Pastor Ken pivots, and he says, okay, but here's the thing, guys. You don't get to pick. You're coming as a Maltese. (laughs) Not Caleb Maltese. You're coming as a little yip-yip dog. And you're going to live among rots and pits and kitas and dobies. And they're going to put up with you for a while, but eventually they're going to tear you limb from limb. And his point was, that's the choice that Jesus made. Except that the distance between man and dog is much smaller than the distance between God and man. But, But that only makes it more dramatic. Jesus condescended to come not just as a human, but as the weakest, most helpless, most utterly dependent form of human. An infant. A dramatic example of taking the lowest place. And the first example from the life of Jesus of what it is to serve. A servant takes, seeks out, embraces, finds a home in that lowest place. Which means 
if we look at an opportunity to serve and we say, I can't be called to that. I'm not a Maltese. I'm an Akita. If we look at an opportunity to serve and we say, well, that's beneath me. I'm more skilled than that. I'm more qualified than that. I should be something, doing something bigger and more important than that. If that's our heart, our heart is missing the point. I've already done that. I don't need to do that anymore. I've outgrown that. I've moved past that. Jesus never said that. <laughs> don't get me wrong, Jesus grew. And he took on new and different ministry as he grew. But he never moved past being human. Today there's a man seated at the right hand of the Father. The ascension didn't reverse the incarnation. When Jesus came as a man, that was a one-way trip. He became man and forever will be man. He also came as a servant and forever will be a servant. Forever placing himself beneath others to do what's best for them. Luke chapter 2. We could stay in Luke chapter 1 longer. We haven't exhausted everything that's there. We could talk about serving doesn't always make sense. Case in point, Mary. I'm going to do what now? <laughs> Ministry doesn't always make sense, but I want to keep going and draw lessons from Jesus' entire life. Because Jesus didn't just serve in coming and Jesus didn't just serve in dying. His entire life was a life of serving. So Luke chapter 2, we've got the actual birth of Jesus. We've got the circumcision on the eighth day, dedication in the temple on the 40th day. We've got the witness of Anna and Simeon. And then we get to verse 39, Joseph and Mary take Jesus home. Luke ignores the flight to Egypt. Luke doesn't talk about the, the visit from the Magi. Joseph and Mary, when they're done in the temple at, 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 at the day 40 mark of Jesus' life, when they performed all the things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee. And the child, Jesus, grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And that's the last thing we know about Jesus for the next 12 years. Luke does a time jump, verse 42. All of a sudden he's talking about how Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the Passover every year. And when Jesus was 12 years old, he went with them. And after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. We know that story because we teach it every time we have a chance in children's church. You see, Jesus was listening, right? Listening. And he was asking questions, but not too many questions. And Jesus always raised his hand. Be like Jesus. But not long after that story, we've got another time jump. We read, starting in verse 51, that Jesus went home with his parents again, subject to them, submitting to them under their authority. And verse 52, he increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. And that's the last thing we read about Jesus until he begins his earthly ministry 18 years later. Luke 3, verse 23, tells us that Jesus was roughly 30 when he began his ministry. So for 18 years, we don't know what was going on. So what's the point? What, what do we take away from this? Luke chapter 2 <clears throat> excuse me, teaches us serving often involves waiting. And our pride hates that. Our pride, if, 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 we, if we convince our pride to serve at all, then our pride flips the other direction. Okay, I'm ready. What are we doing? Where are we going? Here I am. Put me in, coach. Use me. Me, me. But notice even though that even though Jesus was God, even though everyone acknowledged his gifting and calling, he kept himself under others' authority. He submitted and he waited for God's timing. Waited on the right timing and he waited through a season of preparation. Notice twice in, in the passage we looked at, we read about Jesus growing growing physically, growing spiritually, growing in his relationship with people, growing in his relationship with God. I remember in one of my seasons of waiting, and, I, and I've had a bunch, because we all do, 
Four years, I, I was four years with my nose pressed up against the glass waiting to serve. And then it was a year waiting for an opportunity to teach. It was a decade, not so much waiting, but wondering, okay, God, am I, you're you going to call me out or are they going to bury my bones in New Jersey? And when God did call us out, six months of waiting to find out where he was calling us. And, and even when we were here, it was a couple, three years of waiting to really understand, what, God, why, why here, why now? Why, why, why uniquely this place? And, and I don't remember which it was. I remember that I was griping, and that doesn't nail it down. <laughs> but during one of those seasons of waiting and grumbling, Pastor Ed, my mentor, who's coming with us to Israel, by the way, and, and if you missed the Israel meeting, we did record it. So if you want to get um, read in on, uh, on, on what happened there and, and some of the uh, look at some of the slides and, and the discussion of the itinerary and some of the questions. Um, hit me up and I can, I can give you a link to that recording. But, but, but during one of these seasons of, of, of lightly grumbling, Ed looked at me and he just, he just said, Noah, Abraham, Jacob, Moses, David, Paul. It was like I was playing $20,000 pyramid. People in the Bible! <laughs> No, I actually just, okay, like, what about him? He looked back at me and he said, what about him? Because that's how he rolls. He just, like, drops these profound questions and walks away. <laughs> the, the what about him is that they all had seasons of waiting. All of these great men of God had a season of waiting. And, 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 and they all had things they needed to learn in that season. In a lot of cases, they didn't know what it was they had to learn. In some cases, they didn't think they had anything to learn. N not Jesus, obviously, but even Jesus had an opportunity to learn and grow and wait until he was 30. You might be in a season of waiting now. You know that you're called to ministry. You, 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 you sense a calling on your life. You, you believe and others bear witness to the fact that you're gifted. But you're like David. You, you, you're, 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 you're ready. You, you, you've been anointed, but, but the door isn't open because Saul is still there. Maybe, maybe you know that you're called to marry. God's placed that desire in your heart. You know that you're not called to singleness. But you're like Jacob and you're waiting. And then you're waiting some more. Maybe you're called to have children. And you're waiting like Abraham and Sarah, like Hannah. You're waiting for the opportunity to love someone and, 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 and to take an infant and serve them in Jesus' name. Luke, Luke 2 reminds us if we're called to serve, whether in ministry or in family, whether, I mean, whether church family or a married with children family, part of that ministry will be waiting. And in that waiting, remember the same God that placed that desire in you the same God that has called you and gifted you is growing you and preparing you for the ministry that he has for you. Luke chapter 3. Peaked ahead already to get Jesus' age, but the bigger story here is the baptism of Jesus. Verse 21, John's baptizing people because he's John the Baptist, and that's what he does. And when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heavens was opened. The heaven was opened, or the heavens were opened. It's one or the other, not both. While he prayed, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. <coughs> Slipping a little I am statement in there. You might have seen posts on social media recently. There was a children's book apparently marketed to Christian families, with, with Jesus in it saying, I must go down to the river to have my sins washed away. Speaking of baptism. Either, either Jesus says, I have to go have my sins washed away, or somebody says about Jesus, hey, look, Jesus is going down to the river to have his sins washed away. There's two problems with that. One is that baptism doesn't wash away any sins. And the second is that Jesus doesn't have any sins to wash away. Why was Jesus baptized? That, I mean, that's an interesting study. The short answer is to identify with us you and I who do have sin that we need to repent of and to be washed away not with the waters of baptism but with the blood of Jesus. Whole study unto itself. 
But what we tend to miss, because we get preoccupied with this question of why does Jesus need to be baptized again, is the fact that as he was being baptized with water, he was also being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Those things don't always happen at the same time. Sometimes baptism with the Holy Spirit happens at the same time as salvation. Sometimes it's a, it's a separate transaction. I don't, I don't think I know anybody personally who was baptized in the Holy Spirit while they were baptized with water, but it could happen. I wasn't baptized in the Spirit until almost two years after I was saved. They don't always happen at the same time. In Jesus' case, they did. Verse 22, the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus like the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples at Pentecost. Remember, there's three relationships with the Holy Spirit. There's the Holy Spirit with us. There's the Holy Spirit in us. And then there's the Holy Spirit upon us, which always speaks of power. Again, the clearest place that we see this is in Acts. Ten days before Pentecost, Jesus tells the disciples, Acts 1.8, don't start doing ministry yet. Don't just do something. Stand there. Tarry. Wait in Jerusalem. Because if you try to do ministry now, it, it won't go well. You'll be quite bad at it. But you shall receive power, Acts 1.8, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Luke 3 reminds us the power that the disciples needed is the power that Jesus needed. And the power that Jesus needed is the power that we need. The power of the Holy Spirit to serve God and to serve each other. The power to worship and be witnesses. Is it really important? Jesus thought so. He told the disciples, don't leave home without it. Don't leave home without him. Don't undertake ministry without the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They were already indwelt by the Spirit. But the Holy Spirit hadn't come upon them with power. Is it important? Jesus thought so. God the Father thought so. He didn't ask Jesus to begin his ministry without being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Why? Because God wants to do exceedingly abundantly beyond what we could ask or think. We read it a couple chapters ago. God wants to do exceedingly abundantly what we could ask or think. That certainly means beyond what we could do in our strength, in our wisdom. In my power, I can only do unremarkably and unexceptionally what my feeble mind can imagine and what my, my, my failing body can accomplish. With God's power, look out. Charles Stanley says... Serve in our strength, we get what we can do. Serve in God's strength, we get what he can do. Charles Stanley also said, earthly wisdom is doing that what comes naturally. Godly wisdom is doing what the Holy Spirit calls us to and enables. Charles Stanley's spot on. <laughs> Yet at the same time, there's, there's a part that I think that he misses. There's, 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 there's another aspect to laboring in our strength, in our wisdom. When, when we do, we're not only asking for lesser outcomes. We're, we're not only begging, basically, for inferior results or, or, or more likely outright failure. We're also pretty likely to experience burnout in the process. Be, because, because think about it. God is going to call us to serve in ways that are not only beyond our understanding, but way beyond our ability. If we try to serve God and each other in our own strength, it will either prove ex impossible or exhausting or both. Corey Ten Boom, who knew something about serving the Lord, said trying to do the Lord's work in your own strength is the most confusing, exhausting, and tedious of all work. But when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, then the ministry of Jesus just flows out of you. One of the most common complaints among those who serve whether as pastors or paramedics or, or, or in, in any context, is burnout. It's a real thing. It happens. And, and, it's, and it's not pretty when it does happen. But here's the thing. If we're, if we're serving the Lord, it shouldn't happen. Why? Because where God guides, God provides. If I'm burned out on ministry, I'm either doing ministry that I'm not called to, in which case I'm probably doing it in my strength because God is saying, well, that was your idea. 
You want to do that? You do the heavy lifting. I'll be over here when you're done. If I'm burned out, I'm either doing ministry that I'm not called to or I'm doing ministry that I am called to in my own strength. Which is why when somebody talks to me about burnout, my first question, sympathetically, not accusingly, but my first question is, hey, tell me about your devotional life. Because if there's burnout, either someone has misunderstood their calling or they're not laying hold of God's power. And the remedy for both is to be being filled with the Spirit. Be being filled with the Spirit so we know what to do. Being filled with the Spirit so we can do what we know. I said earlier, we have a temptation to look at Jesus and say, well, he's the exception to every rule. I can't serve like him. If that's our pride talking, we need to crucify our pride. If that's our experience talking, if we've tried serving and that's what's happened, if that's what our experience has taught us, we need to go back to Luke chapter 3. If we're trying to serve like Jesus and failing, if we're ending up exhausted, depleted, dejected, burned out, it's not because we're not Jesus. It's because we're not relying on the Holy Spirit like Jesus. We're not being filled and refilled and refreshed continually in the Spirit like Jesus. We're not walking and serving in the Spirit like Jesus. Luke chapter 4. When I was praying about this message, my initial thought was that we could do this in one morning. I said to Ann, don't laugh, but here's what I want to do. 24 chapters in Luke. So we go 60 seconds a chapter, 60 seconds. That's enough to get a point across. We'll do it like a slideshow. Bing, 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 bing. We'll knock them out. That's doable, right? She laughed. <laughs> Told her not to laugh. She laughed. So I went down a couple of verses in Ephesians about the part about wives respect your husbands. She said, I am. <laughs> I don't want other people to laugh or cry. <laughs> so we're going to do one more and we'll call it a morning. I want to make sure we have time for communion. Luke 4. Just one verse into Luke 4, we know what the chapter is about. We're reminded what's going on. Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returns from the Jordan. He's been baptized. And was immediately led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing, and afterwards, when they had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, turn stone into bread. And then he said, worship me, I'll give you the whole world. And then he said, hey, go to a high place and throw yourself down so the angels will catch you, and that'll be awesome. And, and we're familiar with this because Robbie Nichols taught this chapter earlier this year. And he reminded us that Satan tempts us the same way that he tempted Jesus in the desert. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. And again, lots to study here, but what interests me this morning is when Satan comes at Jesus. And, and there's a two-part answer to that question. Read verse 1 and 2 again. We read that Jesus was tempted throughout his ministry, throughout those 40 days. As Jesus was doing God's work, God's way, in the power of the Holy Spirit, Satan was still coming at him. The Holy Spirit doesn't make us immune to temptation. Oh, 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 that it worked that way. <laughs> but it doesn't. If anything, as we labor in the Holy Spirit, we're a lightning rod for temptation. When we're, when we're threatening to be dangerous for Jesus, we get the enemy's attention. But notice, at the end of the 40 days, there's something else. As ministry is winding down, as the season is nearing its end, Satan comes at him next level. And it's when he's going to come at us especially hard also. Lessons from the life of Christ number four. To serve is to invite temptation. Sometimes more than temptation. Sometimes outright attack. Why? Because when we serve, we're declaring the gospel. And Satan doesn't like it. And because when we serve, when we make our lives about others, when we crucify our pride, when we deny ourselves, our flesh doesn't like it. And our stinking flesh is eventually going to cry out, okay, that's enough. That's enough of serving others. It's my turn. And Satan will say, yeah, it is. Or it'll work the other way around. Satan will whisper in our ear, haven't you been enough about others? Don't, don't you deserve a break? 
And our flesh will say, yeah, we do. I've served and I've given and I've given and I've served and I've sacrificed and submitted more than I ever have and way more than they ever did. Now it's time for me to serve me. You're laughing. What, don't I deserve pleasure? Can't I taste a little power? Don't I deserve a, a, a little bit of privilege? That's, that's the cry of my flesh. Pleasure, power, prestige. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Temptation of the body, temptation of the mind, temptation of the spirit. If you serve, you're familiar with these things. And, and, and I'm using serve in the broadest possible sense. Serve your family, serve in ministry, serve the community, serve your, the nation. If you serve with humility, if you serve sacrificially, those temptations are familiar, and if they aren't, they will be. Because <laughs> they come with the territory. But what also comes with the territory is responsibility to say no. To speak facts to feelings. To resist the temptation that we need to be paid or acknowledged or compensated in some way for our service. If that's our expectation, if we indulge that temptation, we're really not serving. I'm, I'm not saying run in the other direction every time someone tries to thank you or appreciate you or acknowledge you. I said, that, I said last week, that's dumb, because it is. I ask, what draws more attention? No, no, don't steal my crowns. No, I'm but a servant. I'm but a humble worm of the, of the Most High God. No, worship him, ignore me, I'm nothing. Or saying, thank you, praise God. <laughs> I'm making a big deal out of somebody appreciating us, that, that's false humility. Look at me not accepting praise. <laughs> but if, but, but if, if praise is our motivation, if recognition or, or, or some kind of compensation is is our expectation of serving is my way of magnifying myself, promoting myself, advancing myself, calling attention to myself. Even if it's where I find meaning or, or place my identity, and, and that's what I'm getting out of it, then I'm not really serving, I'm bartering. I'm trading value for value. I did something for you, now you do something for me. I did something for you, now I get to do something for me. It's Miller time. I deserve a break today. It's not serving. Because serving is love and love is others. Once upon a time in New Jersey, at a church I was serving at, at the end of a long week and at the end of a long day at the end of the long week, a pastor friend of mine was closing up the church. It was 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock. He's rummaging around in the refrigerator looking for something to snack on. And there's a dozen roses sitting there. Not grocery store roses, like the flower shop roses, the good kind, with the baby's breath and the, and the, and the vase and the stuff. And he looks around. These, these roses belong to anybody? And nobody answers because nobody was in the church. Anybody? Roses? And he tells himself, as he related the story to me later, he told himself, they must have been for a, a funeral. They must be left over for a memorial service. Because sometimes that would happen. Sometimes there would be flowers around the church that came from a memorial service. Or, or, or sometimes after a, a big event, the, the flowers that were the centerpieces would, would be. But you usually don't send a dozen red long stem roses to a funeral. Or, or as a centerpiece. But what he saw was, I can take these home, and I can give these to my wife, and she'll be really happy. So he did, and she was. And, 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 and everything went according to plan, and she lavished affection on him because it wasn't her birthday, it wasn't their anniversary, he hadn't forgotten anything, it was just because he loved her. Until the next day when she happened to be at the church, because she also worked at the church, and she happened to be in the, ref in, the, in the kitchen where another staff member was looking in the refrigerator and said, has anyone seen my roses? <laughs> Quickly deducing that two plus two equals four, 
She said, what are these roses of which you speak? Tell me more about these roses. And he said, I, I got a dozen long stem roses from my wife because it's our 10th anniversary, but I was doing a hospital visit until like 9 o'clock, and I decided to just go home and help put the kids to bed, and, and, but I wanted to take her to lunch and give her the roses today, and, and, and I don't see them anywhere. <laughs> and all of the deposits that my friend had put in his wife's emotional bank account <laughs> were erased and replaced by a corresponding deficit. <laughs> because the ministry that she'd been appreciating turns out wasn't really ministry at all. He hadn't been serving her. He'd been serving himself. Because it was a gesture, but that's all that it was. It didn't cost him. Sacrificial love usually involves some sacrifice, of time or talent or, or, or money, but it didn't cost him anything. It wasn't even about her. It was about him and the attention that he wanted. It's not serving, because it's not love. Love is others. Love doesn't give to get. Love gives to give. Love doesn't serve in the hopes of of that service being reciprocated. Love serves because love serves. Now, it's easy to chuck stones and, and, and tell stories about my brother's failure. I do like telling that story. <laughs> but every one of us has been tempted the same exact way. Every one of us has gone down that exact same road. Every one of us will be tempted that same way again, especially as we serve. The more we serve, the more we will be tempted, I promise you. It's kind of ironic to end this morning on a marriage story. Because <laughs> if we glance back at Ephesians 5, we remember that that's where Paul is headed. Talking to us to, he's talking to us about submitting to one another as the conclusion of his section about imitating God, but also as the introduction to the section about husbands and wives. It's not a coincidence. The first most important opportunity that most of us have to serve is in the context of our marriage imitating God as we love and serve our partners. First and most important opportunity, but not the only opportunity. And so we're going to sit here for, for a couple, three weeks and explore the concept of serving like Jesus throughout our lives, across the many contexts of our lives, so that when we move on and we talk about marriage, it'll actually be a pretty easy conversation because we'll already have unpacked in depth everything there is to say. We just have to move it over to a different context. But as we wrap up this morning, I want to bring the concept of serving back around to where we began. As, as, as Becky comes back up, let's circle back to the cross. Let's circle back to Jesus on the cross. Jesus who did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus, who always was, Jesus, who has existed in fellowship with Father and Spirit forever, since before creation, left heaven and became human, remained God, but became human, took that lower place. But some 33 years later, took a place that was still lower, allowed people that he created to strip him naked. allowed people he created to torture him and beat him and disfigure him to the point where he didn't resemble a human. Allowed people to spit on him and mock him as if he were less than human. Nailed to a cross between two thieves a declaration that he was the lowest of all criminals. 
and on that cross bore God's wrath, received God's justice for crimes he did not commit, paying the price for sin that wasn't his. Is there a lower place? And Jesus submitted to that. Jesus placed himself in that lowest of positions to serve us. Let's take a few minutes as Becky leads us in the song to meditate on that on that truth, on that reality, to ponder and perhaps to pray about Jesus, the Son of Man, servant of all.